this, and I commend this bill to the House. I call the whistle war. Tēnā koe, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to speak on this committee stage debate of the Miners' Court Consent to Relationships legislation, and that's probably a good place to start, given that's a change in title, uh, that when uh, colleague Jo Hayes actually submitted uh, this bill to the Parliament, it was called the Marriage Court Consent to Marriage of Minors Amendment Bill. And so it's really important, I guess, to focus on uh, this concept of formal relationships uh, and also legally recognised relationships, which is in fact what uh, this piece of legislation now does. Because um, I know when we started down this journey, actually it was about joining an international call to end child brides. And uh, in most jurisdictions, uh, we have marriage. And so the original, uh, I guess, intention was to make sure that young girls, that is, anyone under the age uh, of 18, uh, but over the age of 16, uh, who could get married, actually did, do, did so in a manner that reassured us that they had given informed consent uh, and that no harm was being done uh, to that young woman. Because internationally, we know that much harm is done to young women who uh, marry early. A lot of the times, uh, young women marry early and have uh, not good lives, actually, lives full of abuse and family violence. Um, and I'm speaking uh, internationally now from a global context, which is why the UN and a whole lot of other organisations, um, uh, in child brides, um, well, there are a few others, I'll have to Google and, and, and find them, but the reality of what uh, the, the amendments um, have done within the context of New Zealand is actually make it applicable to our country. So because we have more than marriage uh, available to people who want to formalise their relationships, uh, obviously an extension to include civil unions is absolutely merited. And, and in some ways uh, it made absolute sense and it was just something we hadn't thought about because we had only just thought about marriage. Um, so um, everybody, I think, universally could understand uh, why this bill then became applicable not only to marriages but civil unions. I think a lot of people initially are kind of not quite sure about the de facto aspect of it all because actually you don't need the law's permission to have a de facto relationship. Uh, but actually the relevance is how we as a country view de facto relationships and how we view de facto relationships, uh, which is a real quirk of our culture, is that actually you can be in a formal committed relationship and not have been married. And so the reason that we have chosen to include uh, those in a de facto relationship in New Zealand is because they are legally recognised relationships. Uh, the state, therefore, has responsibilities to people who are in de facto relationships. And what we wanted to ensure, uh, and I should read directly from the Select Committee report, excluding one legally recognised relationship could also be contrary to the Human Rights Act 1993, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of marital status. So I wanted to emphasise uh, the rationale by the Select Committee and also the fact that we uh, use human rights legislation, human rights principles, when uh, we're making uh, these types of amendments. And it was great to see uh, the discussion and debate among the Select Committee. And I know uh, Joe and I, Joe Hayes, sorry, my colleague, and I had a few uh, conversations about this because when it was initially were, was proposed, we were a little bit unsure about where it had come from. But um, having uh, read the report from the Select Committee, uh, now understanding the rationale, then it makes absolute sense. So well done, Select Committee, uh, for those particular amendments. Um, I want to focus on uh, the issue about requiring court consent for 16 and 17 year olds wanting to enter these legally recognised relationships. And others have focused on um, Section 18 and the requirement now to go through the courts. Uh, and I guess the jurisdiction of the uh, family uh, court and the family court judge in determining, from my perspective, whether or not uh, the young person has the ability to give informed consent uh, and to ascertain whether or not a young person does have the ability 
to give informed consent. There is a level of engagement uh, between that judge and that young person. Um, Madam Chair. Sorry, a little so wall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and it has been outlined and highlighted uh, within the Select Committee report, the age and maturity, their views, uh, any views of the parties, parents and guardians that can be reasonably ascertained, uh, because at the heart of this piece of legislation is, as my colleague Anahila Konungata Asui Siliki highlighted, uh, our duty of care to um, our children, and that we have to make sure that our children are not being abused and they're not being coerced and they're not being, uh, I guess, led down a pathway where potentially uh, really negative consequences will, would follow them for the rest of their lives. So those ethical principles of informed consent and do no harm are fundamental to changing who the consenting entity should be in a situation where a young person aged 16 or 17 wanted to formalise their relationship. And so I, I wanted to acknowledge those ethical principles because I think when you implement principles and philosophies like that, what they're intended to do is to keep people safe, keep the young person safe, keep us safe as a society because we wouldn't want to have situations where actually our young people have been abused. And we know um, that this issue is um, an interesting one because it has made us also look at arranged marriages or cultural marriages, marriages where people are marrying overseas, uh, coming back to New Zealand, and there are immigration issues. And we know through our work with Shakti uh, that some of those issues um, actually are quite complex in some ways, uh, but we are aware and need to be aware within that whole area uh, what our obligations are, I guess, when we allow people to come into New Zealand under relationship visas, what the implications are, uh, particularly for those young women who then come, because I have seen evidence recently of young women being dumped, they're brought in after uh, arrangements in other jurisdictions, and um, I think that there is more to do in this area, to be quite honest. And so what this bill also does is provide a focus about what we think is important um, as a country. I too want to make a, a comment about the specific re requirement of a cultural report, and we should go back to uh, the origins of this piece of legislation in 2012. And um, it was presented initially to this House by Dr Jackie Blue, who was then uh, a National List MP based in Mount Roskill. And her whole motivation for bringing this bill to the House was her engagement with the Indian community and ethnic community uh, within a community that she served, them highlighting to her the issues that that community have and her desire uh, to do something about the situation that was currently happening. So the fact that we uh, will require or the judge may obtain a cultural report uh, is incredibly relevant uh, to this area because we know that there are some communities within our New Zealand communities that are disproportionately affected uh, by the current state. So uh, we should acknowledge that. Um, and we should also acknowledge, uh, I guess, the advocacy that we've seen um, from groups like Shakti. Um, and Priyanka's here. Oh, I can acknowledge my uh, colleague Priyanka Radhakrishnan, who's worked for Shakti. And I know she can speak more eloquently uh, about um, some of the uh, stories she knows from our community. But again, I just want to highlight uh, that again, explicitly putting in legislation the value, the importance of culture, the relevance of culture, again, just highlights, I believe, uh, how progressive we are as a country, how inclusive we are as a country. And I want to commend the Select Committee for the work that they've done to make sure that the relevance of these changes actually reflect the needs uh, within our own society. Thank you. I call Dr Deborah Russell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 